Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original, musician and record label owner Tom Hazelmeyer creates handmade lino cuts for his album art and packaging designs. Deborah Jinsa Thayer's curiosity of movement and study of the body is exemplified in her piece, Diana Takes a Swim. And Lucy Michelle and the Velvet Lapels perform. These artists and more, now on Minnesota Original. I'm not big on talking about it. I mean, that's been my problem my entire life. <laughs> People have always tried to over-intellectualize stuff, and it's like any art form, music, poetry, whatever, it's supposed to be visceral. That's the point to me. It's like that novel's supposed to move me, that movie's supposed to make me feel a certain way, or that song is supposed to, you know, what, what the hell is thinking got to do with it? I was completely obsessed with all things punk rock as a kid. It was the fastest, rawest, just a big ripped open blister. And it just fit my general demeanor, my personality, which was to pursue that noise, that level of energy. It wasn't enough to sit back and spectate. I want to make records, I want to make flyers, I want to play in bars, I want to write songs, I want to do all this stuff. So that's why I decided to try to start a band. And a lot of the side things that came with it, like being able to design some cassette sleeves and doing a lot of flyers for shows we were playing and stuff, that was like a big breakthrough for me. You know, just the do-it-yourself credo that was part of that movement. But at a certain point, it's like I gotta do something else, I gotta get a job, I gotta have a life. So I signed up for four years. I was literally stationed halfway between Seattle and Vancouver left Minneapolis right when that was blossoming at that point in time with Who's Could Do and Replacements and Soul Asylum. Got to walk out of that at its peak and go to Seattle right when it was pre Mudhoney, Nirvana, Melvins and got to see the, you know, re, re-experience one of those uh, energy explosions for a second time back to back, which actually got me further into music and doing more band stuff than I was actually doing in Minneapolis at the time. Amrep, the record label, basically was just a, a, a vanity label solely so I could get records together so I would get a real deal from a real label for my band called Halo Flies. So I would make records and then in turn send them to Touch and Go and Discord and other labels. And uh, all my friends were kind of tugging on my shirt sleeve saying, well, how'd you do that? How'd you get that done and get that thing and how'd you put a sleeve together? So I started doing it for friends bands. Mud Honey, the U Men. Before I knew it, we were getting written up as a real label. Granted, it was being run out of a box under my bunk in the barracks. Like, literally, and the record label was a hand grenade crate that I would pull out and have the back stock. It was a, tens of dollars involved in it at that point in time. The thing about AMREP, you know, it was an aesthetic. That was the big thing for me growing up, was discovering an aesthetic. Not just a label and not just a, a group of bands or a group of releases, but finding some aesthetic that, that bonded people together, that people were participants in as a community that you just wanted to learn more about and you just couldn't get enough of. Got out of the uh, Marine Corps and moved back to Minneapolis, and uh, the record label was actually gaining more momentum than the band. I was able to still work with music, but also like the other parts I enjoyed, which was the visuals, the design, the art aspect of putting together a whole release became my day job. And I started making stuff really dirty. 
smudges and smears and tears. And I'm like, what am I doing? I just spent three hours to make this smudge look authentic. Wait a second. Scan this. I just got a smudge. It was just like, it, it, it was just like, ah, like get off the computer. The first time I posted a lino cut that I had done and was really proud of, I posted it online and someone said, what Photoshop filter did you use to make that look like a lino cut? That kind of summed it all up. Everyone's used to machine made stuff. It doesn't mean anything. High tech equipment. Spoons. The whole paradigm of music right now is completely changed. There isn't the same old work on the songs, make it, release it, they will come, they will buy it. It's dead. The second you release it in any format, it's available to the entire world for free instantaneously. That said, people still want the object. Like here's a good example, something really cool. Slowly the collectability of vinyl has come back and I think it's a lot of it's because of this desire to have something more than a file on your computer or a password with access to a database with a bunch of songs. These ones are cool. No matter how much they aggregate all the music of the world into one big server, there's always something that a human being made somewhere that creates some different value that you want. With me and the Melvins, we've been working together quite a bit on handmade sleeves hand stamped, literal lino cuts going onto jackets. This is a band that, you know, has been around for 30 years, can fill a room anywhere in the world. Accredited, and rightfully so, with creating of the whole grunge sound. They started literally with Kurt Cobain as their roadie. There's eight albums involved in this box set. Each record is hand silk screened, stenciled, stamped, penciled, Luckily, the first one I opened didn't have any obscenities in it, because most of them do. Like even getting the records made with no label, so that we're hand stamping the name of the record and the record label. It's not an LP anymore. Now it's literally an object. We're only gonna make 100 of these, that's it. But you know, it's like, these are expensive things, but the fan knows this didn't get shoveled off to some factory in Korea. This was handmade, so that's the future. See, the ones I like usually have noise. The ink's not sitting on the paper flat and even, so you're not getting a perfect fill like right there. That's what gives each piece like a different character. What we do is start with a print like this, cut it down, and then glue the print right onto the record sleeve. Seriously, you're not buying this record to listen to the music. I've seen people send me pictures back of them framed up, which makes sense to me. We started doing gallery shows with the, the handmade records. So we were presenting the records as art directly, so as to minimize the confusion among people who just want vinyl records. There's an intentional blending that's going on between the two mediums, the music and the art. I've always liked the juxtapositions though, it's like I've never completely buried myself in one crowd because that, to my mind, brings stagnation. So like joining the Marine Corps or doing art shows just puts you in different places and outside of your comfort zone. It keeps you on your toes. <laughs>
all these different forms, both in a traditional way through science and through an experiential way through dance. And somehow I've been able to blend the two. And they manifest in choreography, they manifest in my teaching, and I'm also a movement therapist. My accountant calls me a movement professional. <laughs> Daddy Takes a Swim is about transformation. The initial piece did start off with a red skirt and a white kimono e top, but as the piece started to develop and it was really about transformation, the fabric became more like water. Water can turn into steam, it can turn into ice, it can turn into all these different things. When you do something like this, it is much more than that because you have this whole 30 foot long fabric that is amplifying the gesture. So, and it can amplify it in a way that you intended or amplify it in a way that you did not. So it's so important to have Heidi, the director, with her clear eyes to be able to say, you know, it read like this. Is that what you wanted? OK, that's good from there. I'm Heidi Geyer, and I am working with Deborah Jensa Thayer as the director for Diana Takes a Swim. One of the things that makes Deborah's work and her movement to me very interesting is she has done a lot of study on the physical body and not just the bones, the muscles, but deep. It gives a kind of texturing of the body that is a little less common in Western dance forms where you have a lot of emphasis on shape that comes from more bony, you know, you'll recognize this kind of thing from ballet um, or your jazz, where you have a lot of very shape-based and very kind of propelled mo movement through space rather than a really interior, deep, rich, layered energy of the body, then that informs how shape emerges, how the body then propels through space. So it's coming from energy to form rather than form creating energy. When on the rollback, as you're getting covered, yeah. still the key thing with that is the focus shift. So that when you're... She really protects the integrity of my vision. And even if I want to take a chunk of material and just throw it in the trash, she'll be like, wait, 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 wait. There, there was something a little mm, interesting in there. Let's hold on to it. And I'll say, OK, because I trust her. I couldn't do it without her. No way. <laughs> yeah. Similarly, when I'm in my composition class teaching, the students will do something. And they don't have the eye yet to be able to see that a gesture will have a spark of something. And get closer. Let's see what this does. Closer and faster. So likewise, I protect their creative processes. And so I think we, we are similar in that respect. Deborah has created over 60 works that have been performed in New York, the Washington DC area, as well as the Twin Cities. She has been recognized with a variety of awards over the years. Uh, one of the more recent ones is a SAGE Award for Outstanding Concept and Design for a work she did in 2010, as well as the McKnight Choreographer Fellowship and several Minnesota State Arts Board Awards. And in the Diana Takes a Swim project, uh, the project is in part supported by a grant from the American Composers Forum that has allowed her to work with Janneke Vanderveld, who is the composer on the piece. One of the things that's really important is that the fabric is red. It refers to the draping in figurative work. We see the, the um, nude women just draped with red fabric. Well, in this piece, she drapes herself and um, is, present, is presenting herself in a way with the fabric. So she's got the power and she's got the gaze. Um, 
you know, people are watching her, but she's watching people watch her. So it's also about power and gaze. This piece where I walk on the fabric downstage is, I call the runway section. This beatbox music to come on, and then I come into a place where it's a runway character. It, I try to keep the observer off balance in that way, just like water. Just like, oh, it's going over here. Oh, no, it's going over here. Oh, oh. This is the way I like to describe modern dance. It's sometimes difficult to recognize because it doesn't have a form, because it's a spirit. It's the spirit of rebellion. So what your teacher does is what you rebel against. And we tend to um, entertain ideas via movement versus just having a kinesthetic, physical experience on stage. When people come and watch my dances, they don't say, well, what does she mean to say? What I don't know if I quite got that. But my hope is that they would go home and create a dialogue with somebody. You know, I saw this thing that kind of reminded me of X, Y, and Z. Or they go home and they cut apart their shirt and make another a tuxedo top out of it. Or they go and paint. Or they do something that inspires their own creative process. So that my work can be a seed. I am the extraordinary Hmong. Rice patty eyes, mouth full, open, filled with opium poppy seed. Hair long, black, like the Mekong. The ghost of my ancestor swimming on my back, waves breaking my spine, sinking like silver, clapping with the poetry of Gutia to the murky depths of my buttocks, sunburnt yellow buttocks, crisp by the McDonald eating sun as I slave beneath him. I'm not sushi, I'm not takeout, and I do not have an ancient secret. Pillsbury Doe people do not ask me for the Dalai Lama's number, because the monks from Shaolin Temple are revolting. I don't know Jet Li, only jet lag, will my spirit cross the ocean to be delivered to toys are us, but Hmong are not welcome in country clubs and corporations inside. Janitors, short order cooks, factory workers, please apply. Wax yourself on, wax yourself off. I already sound off. Don't Daniel sun me. I'm nobody's son. A nomad, sowing my seed, riding my fleece straight into your fortune cookie. Carrying more wisdom in my pocket than Plato's philosopher king. Driving down University Avenue, my future coming through the rear view. She riding steady on his steed, snapping drums, clinking gong, and an ancestor howl fills my ears with sounds of pride. It says, I'm the extraordinary Hmong. I knew that there was this desire inside of me to write a Hmong anthem, or at least my Hmong anthem, and I couldn't get the words out. And then one night, I was watching Late Night at the Apollo, um, and a young woman performed, a uh, phenomenal woman by Maya Angelou, and I thought, there you go. If Maya Angelou can say, I'm a phenomenal woman, then I can say, I'm an extraordinary Hmong. So I wrote Extraordinary Hmong in like 30 minutes and I did some minor editing, but really, you know, when I say the ghost of my ancestor swimming on ba my back, I really do feel in that moment when I was writing that the ghosts of my ancestors were on my back, helping me tell the story of our extraordinary existence. I get really inspired 
when I come to the Hmong market because it's a place for Hmong people to hold on to their culture and those things that are important like the food, the clothes that are being sold here. It's also a place for the larger Minnesota community, whether you're Hmong or not, to come and find out about the Hmong people. It was believed that once upon a time, the Hmong actually had a Rin tradition, but because of persecution from the Chinese, that they were no longer allowed to actually write the, in their language. So what they did was they took the traditional characters and they put it in the clothes. So this character is the eyes of a tiger. So this is the character for tiger. And you see another representation of the tiger eye right here too. I remember when I was a child, my parents dressing me up in a little dress like this and taking me to the Hmong New Year in downtown St. Paul at the River Center. It's so important as we become more Americanized to still hold on to our clothes, to still hold on to our stories, our folk tales, and our history. And that's not saying that we don't want to be less American, but it's just a piece of who we are that we should find valuable, that we should hold on to. This is a traditional skirt that has been made into a bag. Now, you know, the hipster in me says that is way cool, but the traditionalist in me says, this is meant to be a skirt, why is it a bag? So things are forever changing um, in the Hmong community, and I see that change when I come here to the Hmong village. Um, and it's all good, it's all good change, because yeah, why can't we imagine something, for instance, why can't this skirt become a bag, and why can't our traditional folk tales become reimagined to include, you know, the landscape of Minnesota, the landscape of America, and different, some of those different ideas into our folk tales. And that's what I'm trying to do with my writing, is to create stories that have familiar things in different landscapes. Being a storyteller, I think, is in my blood because I got that from my mom. She inspired me to tell stories. And, you know, I work in different mediums. I work in poetry, I work in essay writing, and also playwriting. And no matter what form or what genre I'm using, I feel that I'm always really just telling a story. And I think right now it is so important for us Hmong to remember our stories because how we see ourselves as being Hmong has changed. So it's really important for, I think for myself, to capture that, to capture what was, what is now, and what will be in the future of being Hmong. Did you think?
Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.